Hello guys, welcome today uh, to the very special session today where we are going to tell you how to read the printout of the Humphreys field analyzer. You know, every time you have uh, some doubts about the perimetry, we know the uh, theory part, but actually how to go about the printout, we'll be dealing with that part. Okay, so <clears throat> first of all, Let's start with the very basic, what is the visual field? So we already know that when you are fixating straight ahead, when you are in central fixation, what are the things that you are going to see in your uh, space, okay? So that part of the environment where a steadily fixating eye, eyes are seeing straight ahead. So what are the things that you are able to see that is actually called as a visual field? Then there is a, a thing called as the traqueur. Traqueur is actually the island of vision, a hill of vision in a sea of darkness. So usually when we represent the visual fields, we say that it is actually the hills or uh, uh, it is the island of the vision which is lying in the sea of darkness. So uh, the shape is concerned, so it is actually the shape of a hill. I am going to show you also, it takes a shape of a hill and uh, uh, we have got the peaks there. So the first peak that you get is your fovea. And okay, so if this is your hill, okay, so the peak will correspond to the fovea and I will have the two slopes. If it is something like this, okay, this is your hill. So this uh, slope will actually correspond to the fovea and um, the peak is corresponding to the fovea and I've got two slopes. So one will be your nasal side and one will be your temporal side. So this is very, very clear. Then we come to the blind spot. See, whenever we are talking about the visual field, the blind spot is always there. And you know that this blind spot is actually corresponding to the optic disc. Okay, now optic disc is lying in the nasal retina. I hope you already are aware of this concept. Uh, if you remember, this was your eye, okay. So towards the nasal side is your optic nerve. So if I divide this eye into two parts, okay, this is the one which is nasal retina and this is the one which is temporal retina. And uh, this one is your optic disc. So optic disc will always lie in the nasal retina and therefore the blind spot which is corresponding to this optic disc, this blind spot will lie in the temporal visual field. If you are going with this concept, you will ne never get wrong, okay. So blind spot will always lie in the temporal field. Don't get confused between the retinal fibers and the fields. The optic disc is lying in the nasal retina and the field is lying in the temporal side. So this will help me in reading my printout. Okay, now what is the size of this blind spot? So it is actually uh, 15 degree temporal to the point of fixation and the size is 5 degree to 7 degree. So this blind spot is actually defined in terms of the point of fixation 5 degree into 10 degree. So if you look at your uh, visual field, okay, I will have uh, the four quadrants. So this will be my superior, this will be inferior. Now which will be nasal and which will be temporal, this all depends upon your blind spot. Blind spot, whichever side blind spot is lying, that will be a, the temporal side. So therefore this side becomes temporal and the other side becomes nasal. This is the very basic that you have to follow. If you are following this way, you can easily get on that which eye you are actually seeing. Now, Another important thing is, once you know that this is the temporal side, okay, because blind spot is lying on that side, so whichever side blind spot is lying, that side eye it will be. If I am looking at this eye, so blind spot is on the right side, okay. So because it is right side, therefore this eye will be the right eye, very, very simple. So if I am seeing the blind spot on my left side, okay, so that will be the left eye. If I am seeing the blind spot on the right side, that will be your right eye. This is your um, island or the hill of vision okay you can see the uh, peak peak is your fovea and we have got the two slopes here these slopes will be corresponding to the temporal side and the nasal side so this is again very easy now if i talk about the visual field defects so obviously anything which is deviating from this normal hill of vision that will be my visual field defect it can be a diffuse loss it can be a localized it can be less it can be more 
So diffuse visual field uh, loss means <coughs> so <coughs> that means I have got a generalized loss of sensitivity. I do not have any particular defect, any gross localized defect that is your diffuse one. While if I have the um, reduction in the circumference, if I am taking the visual fields, okay, they are going with respect to the isopter. So, if I am starting with this uh, <coughs> 0 degree, okay, I will be having different uh, isopters. This is one isopter, then I have got second isopter. So, whole of the visual field is actually divided into isopters. So, if my field is actually decreasing from the periphery towards the center, mostly uh, this uh, is the routine which is taking place in the glaucoma that is actually called as a contraction of the isopters okay so you know now what is isopters actually and we can have the scotomas so in general uh, many times we are hearing this word scotoma scotomas means the areas of the decreased sensitivity so wherever i am having the decreased visual sensitivity that is called a scotoma this scotoma can be a central scotoma it can be a paracentral scotoma it can be a ring scotoma it can be uh, you know this uh, relative scotoma it can be an absolute scotoma so we have got uh, various types of scotomas then i can have a positive scotoma also i can have a negative scotomas also so we'll be talking about them first of all let's talk about the central scotoma central scotoma means which is in the center so how will i uh, get to know what is my center center means the point of fixation so whatever is the point of fixation if the scotoma is occurring within five degree that will be your central then after central we'll start with the paracentral so you know that the central is 0 to 30 degree okay so from this 0 to 30 degree if i go if it is 0 to 30 degree so first from 0 degree to 5 degree will be considered as the central visual field and from 5 to 30 this will be considered as the paracentral. So easily I know that the central field is again divided into two the central and paracentral. The innermost 5 degree is your central and from 5 to 30 degree this is your paracentral. Okay. Then you have got certain things certain terms that we are using with respect to paracentral. I have got the cecal, paracecal, pericecal and centrocecal. Cecal means the blind spot. So para and peri. So if it is immediate to the blind spot, it is para. Then afterwards it is peri. And uh, if it is involving the blind spot, then it is centrocecal. So these are the different kind of terms. Like if you talk about the optic neuritis, there we see that optic neuritis causes the central scotomas. Specifically speaking, the centrocecal scotomas because obviously there will be involvement of the blind spot there. Then after central, that means after the 30 degree, I will have the peripheral one. So peripheral peripheral will be on more than 30 degree. So you already know the central and peripheral up to 30 is central and after that that is peripheral. In the uh, central we have got something which is called as central uh, means truly central and then I have got paracentral. All right. So see this is the visual field, this is the central scotoma, the blackish area you can see this blackish area, this is your central scotoma while this is your centrocecal scotoma, this is your centrocecal scotoma, why? Because it is involving this blind spot, so this will be called as centrocecal. I hope you have understood the difference between the central and centrocecal now, alright. Now, first of all, let us see the indications of visual field testing. Why do we do the visual field? So, uh, first of all, if I want to know the extent of visual uh, field in the patient, what is a normal one? Normal is actually the s -nit. your mnemonic is s -nit. So, you have got uh, starting with 50 degree, then 60 degree, 70 degree and 90 degree. These are the values of Parsons because you know slight amount of variation are there in different books especially for the temporal field. So, I am going with the standard textbook that is Parsons 90 degree. Sometimes they are also saying 100 degree. So, superior and nasal though there is not much difference and many books say this is also 60 degree but uh, I prefer to choose 50 degree because it is always in this order minimum is superior then is your nasal then is your inferior and then is the temporal that is why it is better to adopt 50 degree for superior 
you are uh, you know visual fields is actually limited we have limitations like superiorly i've got this brow bone nasally i've got this nose inferiorly i've got this zygomatic bone but temporally is relatively free and i do not have any barriers so temporal fields are free then uh, if i want to uh, detect the diseases either i want to know the normal or if i want to know how much of the defect is caused by the certain diseases if these diseases are actually known to cause the contraction of the visual field then not only we are doing the perimetry for the glaucoma we are also doing for the neurological disorders so in order to get the site of the possible lesion like if you remember in the neurology <coughs> what we are learning in the neuro ophtha we are learning whether it is bitemporal whether it is binasal pine the sky pine the floor or we have homonemous amyonopia so by the type of the defect that i am getting i can easily localize that whether the lesion is in the optic nerve optic chiasma uh, optic tract and lateral geniculate body and so on so for that also i can use and in order to find out the progression also so not only for the diagnosis but also for the <coughs> monitoring you can say for the monitoring of the diseases i am also using the visual field perimetry is considered to be the best test for the optic nerve activity now comes your methods of visual field testing so what are the methods that we can adopt for visual field testing uh, i can use the confrontation method that is a bedside clinical method i'll be talking about this then i can talk about emsler grid that we have already talked in a separate video uh, i'll be sharing the link in the description box if you have not gone through it please go through it and then we have got the perimetry perimetry may you have to <coughs> see uh the visual field with the help of a stimulus now this stimulus will be of the var uh, various size and intensity as well as color now talking about the two types of uh, uh, perimetry though i won't go into much details because we have already talked about the visual fields um, in terms of kinetic and static but uh, just a passing reference so, okay kinetic means moving so here stimulus is actually moving uh, so uh, stimulus which is of same intensity but moving from the periphery towards the center but static means the stimulus is not moving so when the stimulus is not moving you have to increase its uh, intensity so basically uh, in cases of uh, the kinetic perimetry the stimulus is moving so it will be coming from a non seeing area to a seeing area while if i'm talking about the static one there will be increase in the luminance so it will be from the less luminance to more of the luminance and then you should know the examples uh, in the kinetic perimetry we have got goldman's perimetry we have got jerem's perimetry that is your uh, tangent screen that is there then we have got the lister's perimeter arc perimeter is actually the lister's perimeter <coughs> if you remember i told you you can remember it with the bl kapoor hospital bl kapoor hospital b for the germ tangent screen l for lister's and k is for kinetic while if i talk about the static we have got goldman's both sides we have got goldman and then i have got the automated perimetry which is your humphreys field uh, there we also have the octopus so <clears throat> these are the different kinds of uh, the perimeters that we can use this is your uh, jerems tangent screen then we have got the goldmans okay this is your uh, goldmans and <clears throat> then you have got the arc one and uh, this is your humphreys field analyzer now if you look at the differences between the humphreys and the octopus because both are you know automated uh, perimeters so uh, one is your bowel type octopus is your large bowel type while humphreys is a aspherical bowel if you look here okay this is a aspherical bowel well when you get a typical bowel kind of a thing this is your octopus then we talk about the luminance if i talk about the luminance it is uh, more or less same okay it is 31.4 and 31.5 uh the stimulus size <coughs> so size may um, this is uh, your octopus one is having the goldman's uh, size 3 and 5 while <coughs> the humphreys because we are more uh, concerned about the humphreys we have got 1 to 5 duration is concerned here we have got 100 milliseconds here we have got 200 and if you look at the luminance also this is also much more here so in amphries we are using more values then we come to the measuring range now see uh, the measuring range is exactly same 0 to 40 decibels 
Now, another important thing, I think you must remember this. This is uh, ultra, ultra important. What are the testing strategies that I am using? So, if it is the octopus type, the strategies that I am using is the bracketing strategy, dynamic strategy and top. Top is your tendency oriented perimetry. Uh, tendency oriented perimetry ka maybe you must not have heard the name itself because octopus is not very commonly used. Okay, nevertheless, not a problem. But uh, you should know the strategies that we are using in Humphreys field analyzer that is your CETA standard and CETA fast. So, this you should know and uh, when we read the printout also, okay, there also you have to <coughs> take this into consideration that whether we are using the CETA standard or we are using the CETA fast. I hope you know the full form of CETA, okay, don't that don't consider it to be that CETA, okay. And if you know it, please type it in the comment section also, right. Now, there are certain terms that we are actually using uh, with respect to this um, visual field. One is your threshold. So, we always talk about the threshold, pre-threshold. So, what is this threshold actually? The weakest stimulus which is just visible to the patient, okay. The amount of this threshold stimulus may not be same at every point of the visual field. So, it can vary across the visual field, but certainly this is important. What is the weakest amount of uh, stimulus that the that is actually visible to the patient? Then second thing is your sensitivity. Sensitivity means... Uh, uh, what is the actually the, uh, the definite characteristics of the stimulus at a particular point that will become the sensitivity. Third is your fixation, okay. Fixation means it is that part of the visual field that we are corresponding to the central vision that is fovea centralis. And then we have got something that is uh, called as isopter. Now, I showed you by drawing that these are isopters, but how did you get these isopters? So, if I am getting the points in my visual field, okay, and if I join all the points who are having the same amount of uh, what you call as a visual field. So, if I am joining all the points which are having the same amount of visual field, suppose uh, these are the points which are having the same amount of visual field. So, if I join this, this is my uh, isopter. Then again, if I join these points which are having the same amount of visual field, then I am going to get second isopter. This is what you mean by isopter. Then uh, we have got the appositive. This is the unit of the luminance and decibel is the measure of sensitivity. So, you should know these units also. Now, coming to the fundamentals of parametry measurement. So, there are certain uh, fundamentals. What are the things that you have to see? The first is your spot intensity. Spot intensity will be directly related to the bowel intensity means what are the points that are being given in that bowel that is spread it. So, <clears throat> what is the intensity at one particular point that will be your spot intensity. Then second important thing is your background illumination. How much amount of illumination should be there because basically you know perimetry is a darkroom procedure and uh, <clears throat> in order to give a good contrast between the luminance that you are providing to the patient and the outside one we do it in the dim light or dark. So, <clears throat> what is the standard uh, illumination that you have to maintain okay approximate minimum level for the photopic vision then you have to see what is the pupillary size media clarity is there or not because all these things will actually affect the ultimate result of the perimetry then the second important thing is your spot duration how much amount of time the uh, this uh, spot should be shown to the patient so if you go with the standard duration, this is 200 millisecond plus minus 10 millisecond could be there and its visibility is independent of the duration. Latency for the voluntary eye movement not present. So, we will not take into consideration any latent period. You have to uh, take certain minimum amount of time for which this will flash and that is about 200 millisecond. Okay. <coughs> Now, talking about the spot size. Spot size, if I, if you remember, Humphrey May, it was from 0 to 5. So, these are the different spot sizes that we have got. This is your third, this is fourth, okay, this is fifth. We are going through 1 to 5 and the very small is 1 and 2. So, if you look at the sizes, they are going in the increasing order. So, when I am saying spot 1, spot 2, spot 3, 4, 5, you can imagine what should be the size of that spot, okay. Now, next thing comes is your catch trials. Catch trials means you have to see that the visual field testing that you have done, the perimetry that you have done, how much reliable it is. 
okay so you have to see the reliability indices now for seeing the reliability i've got three things one is your fixation losses one is false positive and one is false negative for first is your fixation losses fixation losses means whenever the patient is undergoing the perimetry he should uh, he or she should maintain the central fixation so how many times he or she is actually losing that steadiness of the gaze that is your fixation losses and if it is going more than 20 percent it is certainly unreliable so all the fixation losses should be less than 20 percent then second thing is false positive false positive means the person is trigger happy very very anxious and even if he is not seeing that target he is triggering that button that is uh, the number of uh, the false positives that I am getting and uh, if it is again going more than 33 percent then it is unreliable and the third important thing is false negative so false negative means when the patient gets tired even when um, he is able to see he is not able to uh, run the buzzer or he is not uh, uh, ringing the bell even, uh, even in those areas which he <coughs> was able to see in the previous recordings. So that is your false negative and again it should be less than 33 percent because if you know false positives and uh, false negatives are going more than 33 percent then it becomes unreliable. So fixation losses should be less than 20 percent, false positive and false negative should be less than 33 percent. Now let's talk about the new threshold strategies. The new threshold strategies which are available one is your fast pack 1991 may it was started and uh, presently jo hum use kar rahe, that is your sita 1997 sita standard and sita fast uh, that i told you okay all the other information you need not to learn just remember two new threshold strategies one is your fast pack then sita standard and sita fast okay all right now coming to the testing strategies what are the strategies we can use so one is your 30 dash 2 strategy 30 dash 2 uh, means that I am inspecting the central 30 degree the number of test points will be 76 density 6 degree and only have a very small area is left bare that is 3 degree all right then we have got 24 2 24 dash 2 this is your central area here you are going to see the central 24 degrees so you should know whatever is the testing strategy if I am saying 30-2 or I am saying 24-2. So that means the first um, number that is written that means I am looking at that much area. So 30 degree or 24 degree respectively. Then there is something which is called as a macular program. Macular program may the number of test uh, points is 16 and the point density is 2 degree. This is very very specific just looking at the macular area. Okay. Now we come to the printout. I think this is the uh, most important part how to read the printout. Now before we actually go to the printout let me give you a brief outline. When you see the printout we have got actually 8 zones. 8 zones will be there and uh, we will be dividing these zones like if I see the zone 1. Zone 1 may you have to give the personal details of the patient, what is the name, what is the age, what is the correction, if he is using something, what is the visual acuity, dilated or undilated, the pupillary size and what is the strategy used, what is the reliability criteria, the fixation losses, false positive, false negative, all these things. Um, okay. So reliability uh, criteria, um, visual acuity and pupillary size, these things will uh, be coming in your zone 2, okay. These things are coming in your zone 2. Zone 2 will give me uh, the visual acuity, the pupillary size and the reliability criteria. So uh, I have got zone 1 in which there will be personal detail along with the strategy. Zone 2 may what is the visual acuity, pupillary size and the reliability criteria and then I have got the zone 3. In the zone 3, I have got the grayscale highlights. Grayscale highlights means uh, this area is your gray uh, one. This is your gray one. Okay. So, this is your gray zone highlights in which you are able to see the numbers and uh, whether you know all the areas are equal or not or we have got depression. So, this is your grayscale. Okay, and uh, then below this I will have the zone 4. In the zone 4, first I will have the total deviation and below this I will have zone 5 that will show me the pattern deviation. Total deviation, pattern deviation, then according to the total deviation and the pattern deviation we will be 
calculating certain indices. So, 6 will be your global indices and uh, then finally, I will be you know concluding it, 7 will be your glaucoma hemifill test and finally, I will have 8, 8 will be your raw numeric data. So, in this manner, I am going to show you, okay. Now, look at your zone 1. If this is your, uh, okay, field, first of all, have a full look, okay, uh, something like this kind of a printout we have. And uh, what are the things we are going to look here? This is your zone 1. Can you see this zone 1, the personal details are given. So, first thing that you have to see, what is the name of the patient, age of the patient, uh, uh, which I uh, is being used then what is the strategy so if, if somebody is giving you the printout and uh, like they say examiner says that uh, which strategy is being used look at the zone one okay like you can go through hole also then also you will find but if you directly look at zone one I think that will give you an edge uh, patient will come uh, this examiner will come to know that you know that which area shows which things and also it will save your time. Then we have got zone 2, this is your zone 2, zone 2 will give you the visual acuity, pupillary size, the reliability criteria, then this is your uh, zone 3, this will be gray, uh, giving you the gray scale, then 4, this will be giving you the numeric data, this is giving me the numeric data, then I have got 5, this will be your total deviation, then I will have the pattern deviation, pattern standard deviation, then I will have the glaucoma hemi field test, the indices I have and then finally um, I will have the raw numeric data. So, these kind of you know, uh, this is another one that you can see but the zones will remain same. Uh, again, I have got this uh, as 1, then 2 I have got, then we have got Okay, three. So, the same manner it will go and I will have, you know, different uh, kind of things which are uh, available then uh, I will have. So, this will be your four, then we will have five, okay, this is six, this is seven, this is eight and this will be your nine. So, that, that will remain same and it is always good that you go in this order, okay, start with one, two, three, four, five and you keep on, you know, interpreting the things from that, okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> Let's talk about the grayscale because we have already talked about the reliability criteria. Grayscale, highlight areas, okay. So, if you see the grayscale, you, you need to actually focus on the highlighted areas, look into detail and uh, you know for, um, you have to look uh, what are the areas which are actually having uh, gross depression. Okay, whether darker areas you are getting in the periphery or the darker areas that you are getting in the center, that will give you the gross uh, errors, okay. Can you see this one? So, you can see that certain areas, you know, they are darker. So, they are actually showing you the areas of decreased sensitivity, something like this. Then we have got something which is called as a total deviation plot. Now, what do you mean by this total deviation plot? This is actually the point to point, you know, uh, comparison of this patient's vision with the age meshed normal control individual. So, obviously, you know, um, we are having uh, fixed data which has been fed up in that machine for that particular age group, okay, and point to point, you know, comparison is done. And uh, then this is actually depicted by a numerical and a probability plot. We are actually doing it. Uh, probability plot. Now, what do you mean by this probability plot? Means what are the chances of abnormality in the normal population at that age? And how much is the uh, changes which are occurring in this patient? So, probability means whatever is the amount of changes that we have seen in the normal individuals of that age, that is the probability and actually is how much is actually problem in this patient. So, the blackest dot, wherever you are getting the blackest dot, that is less than 0.5 percent of the normal population. So, there are less than 0.5 percent chances of getting this abnormality in the normal population that is represented by the blackest dot and um, this will actually demonstrate and highlight any scotoma that could be present. So, it is a very convenient way wherever you are going to get the dark black area that means in these areas the patient is having less sensitivity and how much less 
there uh, which is less than 0.5 percent of the probability being founded in the normal individuals okay all right then uh, we have got something which is the pattern deviation pattern deviation means localized effects okay so if you are getting certain localized effects again we will have the same two plots one will be on numerical plots and one will be on probability plots means how much is the uh, value in this person and probability means how much is the uh, chances <coughs> of having these type of defects in the normal population all right so if i talk about the total points total points are 51 points the seventh highest sensitive value uh, relative to the age okay that will be giving you h8 of the hill vision so you have to give a value with respect to the normal so suppose i am getting you know um, 85th percentile so highest sensitivity area if i am getting 85th percentile so that will correspond to h8 of the hill of vision okay i know this is something which is very complex nevertheless not a problem okay you get a general idea what is total deviation that is the uh, comparison from the age match normal and uh, pattern deviation means the localized effect. Okay, not a problem. Then in 10 0 pattern, all the points are considered, and um, that is why most of the time we are, you know, uh, in a way, uh, want to do the 10 0 pattern. 10 2 means looking at 10 degree. Okay. Now, see this. <clears throat> now, let us try to assume that this is uh, the perimetry printout which has been given to me. So which side I it is now it is written on the printout also but sometimes suppose I have hidden it and I have given you as a question then how can you tell. So if you look here these are your fields here okay then you have to look for the blind spot so this uh, if you are able to appreciate can you see this this uh, most dark area this the most dark is your blind spot okay. So now if you see this uh, area, this side is a blind spot, so this side will be the temporal. So my left side is having temporal, so therefore it is a left eye. So it is as simple as that. My left side is showing blind spot, so it is left side. If my right side shows the blind spot, it is actually the right side. Then uh, we come to the global indices. Global indices may, uh, we have got certain of the values and the index that are used. One is your mean deviation, then we have got the pattern standard deviation, then we have got the short term fluctuations and corrected pattern standard deviation. Okay, we will not go into the details of it, but yes, these four indices are used. One is a mean deviation, okay, one is your pattern standard deviation, then what are the short term fluctuations and corrected one, corrected pattern standard deviations, these are the indices you are going to get, okay. Next we come to the glaucoma hemifield test. So, what happens in the glaucoma hemifield test, we are going to take 5 sectors in the upper field, okay, versus 5 sectors in the lower field, which are your exactly mirror images. That's why it is called as a hemifield test. 5 sectors of the upper one and the 5 sectors of the lower one. So, what happens when we can say that it is actually outside the normal limits, if you are getting at least one sector score, uh, which is having a difference more than that is found in more than 99% of the population, then it is outside the normal limits, okay. Uh, it could be, you know, borderline, we can get a generalized reduction, we can get abnormally high sensitivity also, or it can be normal limits. So, we uh, depending upon, you know, what kind of uh, vision the patient has, uh, it can be within the normal limits, it can be outside the normal limits, it can be a borderline, it can be a generalized reduction or it can be a high sensitivity also. So whatever uh, is the interpretation that we are getting, we are going to see that, okay. Then there was something which is called as a raw numeric data. Raw means we have nothing uh, where you have modified anything, any values which have been modified, nothing of that sort has been done. We have just uh, plotted the numeric value. These numeric values are actually the score in decibels for those points. So, uh, what is that threshold? The lowest stimulus at which your uh, patient is able to see. So, we have given a value for that. That value is actually in the decibels and we have actually plotted as it is. That is called as a raw numeric data. <clears throat> then we have got a criteria which is very commonly used called as the Anderson and Patelas criteria for the diagnosis of the clockometer's field. Uh, 
defect in the absence of the retinal or the neurological diseases affecting the visual fields. So there are certain criteria which are used, okay, we will not go into the details, that will be beyond your scope, but I think you should know the name of the criteria, it is actually the Anderson and the Petalas. Uh, criteria that we are going to use for the glaucoma, right? Now we can classify the defects that we are getting in uh, early defects or we can say mild defects, moderate defects and the severe defects. So uh, you can easily remember the early defects means if you are having a deviation less than 6 decibel, if your deviation is between 6 to 12 okay then it is your moderate and if it is even more than 12 it is severe so you can simply remember the criteria less than 6 6 to 12 and more than 12 like for example if i look at this so you can see that we have got the blackish areas in the periphery so there is a generalized depression in the periphery central area is the is the seeing area so here we have got the central vision that is left and the peripheral vision is lost. So, there, it can be you know corresponding to the glaucoma where we have got the first uh, peripheral constriction of the visual field and the central island is spared. Now finally some of the very important you know dictums when you are going to do the perimetry never rely on the first report okay. There are always chances that uh, the patient may not have understood the proper instructions or there is something which has gone okay don't rely on the all, only means don't take action only just on the basis of your first report. Second important thing correlation clinically is very important like they can be false positives they can be false negatives okay correlated then if the patient has any significant amount of refractive error beforehand you have to correct it plus you have to also take into consideration there are different um, sources of error which could be there okay there could be uh, meiosis there could be un uh, uncorrected um, refractive errors the patient could be having hyperopia uh, if the patient is wearing spectacles we can have rim scotomas there could be ptosis and due to that ptosis there can be a suppression of the superior visual field so just if I, you are getting the superior you know depression don't uh, just say that there is a problem in the field maybe this is due to ptosis so all these things have to be taken care of and I think uh, one very important a way uh, of uh, ignoring these sources is correlation clinically. If uh, the, at all the patient is having the visual fields, then you will be able to correlate clinically, you will be able to get the um, diagnosis, you will be able to get uh, the symptoms also, okay. The patient will also complain and you will get the uh, cause also in the patient and then accordingly, okay. First you have to examine, then you have to do the test and then again you have to examine, come back to it, just don't take any action on the basis of a single perimetric reading. So I hope you enjoyed the session and get to learn something new, how to read uh, about the printout, how to go about the printout. Like uh, the purpose of this video was not to make you the masters of Humphrey's field analyzer, but give you some idea how to go about it so that uh, even if you get a printout or you get a question related to it in the exam, you have the general outline and you do not fall into panicky how to go about it. So I, I think um, this will help you in solving the questions related to the Humphreys field analyzer. Do uh, uh, leave me a feedback and a comment so that I will be motivated in making more of such videos which will help you in your practicals too. Do like the video if you like really liked it and please do subscribe the channel because so many times you know you are asking for the same videos that I have, I have already given to you. So in order to get all the notifications and remain updated with all the videos do subscribe and share as much as you can. Thank you and happy ophthalmology.